Devil is on his way. Devil is on his way, motherfucker. Oh, the devil gonna make you pay. Fall to your knees. Devil is on his way. Fall to your knees. Devil gonna make you pay. Fall to your knees. Devil is on his way. Motherfucking knees. Are- Mountain Murders is an Appalachian true crime podcast. Some content may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. We say fuck a lot. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to Mountain Murders. I'm Heather. And I'm Dylan. How are you, Dylan? I am doing wonderful. That's great. How are you? I am fucking wiped out, I have to say. (laughs) Yeah, uh, so yeah, if you'll share with the listeners right quick, you had a very interesting experience today, correct? Today was my first day as a substitute teacher. And let me just say, I have concerns about the future. The future of this nation. Yes. And you have a, a, a newfound respect for people like Jenny, who are teachers on a daily basis. Yes, n- not that anybody else out there knows who you're talking about, but yes... Jenny, our friend who is a teacher. Yes, Dylan. Yes, very. Uh, I don't know that I could do it, and I commend you for your attempt. It takes a lot of patience and understanding, and um, yeah, I, I got hit on by a freshman boy today. That's, okay. And when he asked me where I was going after school, and I said, home to my husband, he said, I'm not afraid of your husband. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So you got to watch out. He's got game, right? He does. And he told me all about digging for ginseng. Didn't he tell you you look 20 all day? He told me I look 20 all day. Ah, yes. And he's... then at some point he said, maybe you look 60. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I'm 68. And his eyes got like really big. And he's like, really? And I said, shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> I'm an unaging. I'm a vampire. <laughs> it was an experience. I'm going back tomorrow and then again at the end of the week and I'll decide by Friday whether I'm cut out to do this. <laughs> I would say it takes a lot. It's a it's it is a lot. To wrangle those children no matter what age they are. You know, it's probably a lot better if you have lesson plans going into it. That would probably be helpful. So basically I was just like winging it today. You had a class that was kind of uh, just do whatever it wants. It was almost like a class that would be in one of those old Michelle Pfeiffer movies. Where it, she- it was like it was a classroom that would definitely be in one of the '80s movies. Yeah, and and you get the teacher from like the wrong side of the tracks or something who comes in and is trying to like make a difference, and that yeah. teacher's not me, so it has to be someone else, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you have all these uh, students; they're all k- different kind of characters. Oh my gosh! Yeah, one of the girls was telling me she couldn't go to lunch. In the, in the cafeteria because she got into a fight and so she couldn't be in the cafeteria because she wanted to fight. Then she told another student she was going to fight her in the front yard. And I said, well, why are you, why you want to fight her in the front yard? Why not the backyard? And she goes, because people can see it in the front yard. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So every time she sees this person, she just wants to fight and that's it. I guess. That's the only thing that yeah, can happen. Yeah. Okay. We've all been there, right? Yeah, yeah, I guess. We've all got that person. Makes us want to throw <clears throat> hands and chicken nuggets. Okay. So before we go any further, I would like to t- thank today's sponsor of this episode, um, who gave so generously over there at patreon.com slash Mountain Murders Podcast. Uh, Tish is today's sponsor. Thank you, Tish. Thank you so much. And she joined our Discord. So I'm so excited. You're so excited? Yes. He gets excited, y'all. He will get to know Tish. Okay. Well, are you ready to get into this case, Dylan? I told you earlier, this case is going to make you so fucking mad. Oh, my God. You are going to be plum infuriated. <laughs> I'm going to be plum infuriated. Plum infuriated. Okay, yep. so let's dive straight in. Okay. We're still in Georgia. I, I love I loved them peaches. Timothy Wayne Coggins was born August 29th, 1960. He was the fourth of eight children born to Viola Coggins Dorsey in the rural Spalding County um, area of Georgia, which is about 45 minutes south of Atlanta. Spalding at the time was a farming community and not without its racial issues. 
Even today, the area is a conservative stronghold, having only voted um, for for Democrat presidential candidate back in 1980 when it voted for Jimmy Carter. Oh, wow. That's the only time the county has like swung for a Democrat. And that was because Jimmy was from Georgia, from I'm Georgia. sure. So as I'm saying, it's a super conservative stronghold. Rural farming area, I mean, by today's standards, you know, it's it's had some growth and development, but at the time of our story, it was it was a pretty small town. Okay. Growing up in a big family, Timothy was closest with his sister, Talisa, who was two years younger. He had taught her to ride a bike and how to make her way home from the grocery store by herself. Those who knew Tim said he never met a stranger. A charismatic personality, he was funny and outgoing, enjoyed hanging out with friends and meeting new people along the way. Uh, those are very important skills I think sometimes are overlooked, riding a bike and being able to find your way back from the grocery store. It's true. Yes. And what a great big brother to teach her these skills. <laughs> yeah, no, nobody ever taught me. And to this day, I still have trouble getting back home from the grocery store. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> oh no so he sounds like a, a great big brother loves his loves his um, little sis there so yeah that's awesome and they're close in age and so not only are they siblings but it sounds like you know they're buddies they hang out he's a good big brother to her and he's never met a stranger he loves meeting new people you know folks said that it didn't matter where he went e- either he walked in and he knew everybody in there already and by the time he left he knew all all the people he didn't know before Okay, so somebody not afraid to talk to people they don't know, get to know them, kind of, uh, you know, uh, likes to conversate, right? He had an infectious smile, and the ladies noticed him, Dylan. He was a good-looking guy and had that charming personality, that big smile, made the ladies laugh, and they really liked him. He had caught the eye of a white woman named Ruth Guy, Interracial dating was highly disregarded in Spalding during the 1980s, where the Klan chapter still had regular rallies and parades. In Griffin, the largest city in Spalding County, there was a black side of town and a white side of town. Like, there was a definite racial divide. Man, that's scary that they would just um, just have open rallies and stuff all the time. That, that's a pretty scary thought. In 1980. Well, here's an example, Dylan. In December of 1980, Klansmen showed up for the annual Christmas parade with a flatbed truck decorated for the event. They entered the parade under the name Spalding Men's Club, which is how the Klan were able to maintain checking accounts and receive mail. Parade officials had no idea the Klan had entered until they showed up for the parade. Of the five Klan members on the float... All were unmasked, but they did wear their clan robes. A recording of Dixie was playing, and the float had U.S. and Confederate flags flying. Deputies escorted the float, and though there were no issues, the crowd yelled boo and threw candy back at the Klansmen. The Chamber of Commerce issued a statement later saying they would legally try to prevent any radical group from participating in future Christmas parades. (laughs) So, as far as the town's concerned, this so-and-so men's club has rented a spot in the parade. And they're like, okay, you know, we, we'll see. And then the clan, fully garbed clansmen show up. to stand. I bet there were people just like, oh, my God. It sounds like it, yeah. On the evening of October 9th, 1980, former Spalding County Sheriff's Deputy Jesse Gates, who happened to be one of the few black police officers... Um, was working a shift, and he was flagged down by his friend Timothy Coggins. Timothy asked Gates if he could get a ride to a black dance club on the outskirts of town called People's Choice. During the 15-minute ride over to the nightclub, Timothy told Gates he was dating a white woman. Gates told his friend, quote, Man, you need to watch yourself dating them sisters like that because we live in Griffin, Georgia, and not Atlanta. Some people just don't accept things like that. When Gates pulled up to the club to drop off Timothy, he spotted three white men hanging around outside the nightclub. He thought it was strange because white people, especially white men, did not come to that nightclub, and it made him feel uneasy. But they weren't doing anything illegal, so, I mean, he wasn't going to confront them. He went on about his evening. That's a shame for someone to have to even think like that, you know? 
be wary of the person that you're attracted to because it could cause problems. People's Choice was a brick building painted black and tan with a red sign out front. It was considered the black side of town on a country road outside of Griffin. On a Friday night, it was the place to be. Talisa was there with her big brother. The club had a fully stocked bar and barbecue for sale. I, I mean, I, I heard this and I was like, this is the nightclub I want to yeah. go to. <laughs> I want some barbecue. Yeah. I, after a couple of beers, I would definitely want a pulled pork sandwich. Right. And uh, just be hanging out. The club played music like Marvin Gaye and Aretha Franklin. And in 1983, a lot of Michael Jackson. <laughs> Again, sounds great. I know, right? I was like, this sounds like the place. The dance floor was packed with bodies and Tim was usually center stage. He was considered a showstopper with his dance moves, and his personality would really shine when he was on the dance floor. It had not gone unnoticed the past few weeks that Tim had been in the company of a white woman, again, because the club was almost exclusively black. Deputy Gates hadn't been the only friend to point out that Timothy needed to be careful dating a white woman, so it was a shared sentiment among his circle of friends. Talisa was going to the club bathroom when she overheard people saying there were white men outside the bar asking for her brother. Moments later, Talisa watched her brother go outside to meet the men, and it was the last time she would ever see him alive. No one had noticed that Tim had gone missing. Now, it was not unusual for him to disappear for a few days at a time. He had a lot of friends and was well known around town. So his family assumed that Tim had crashed at a friend's house. It wasn't until two days later when a sheriff's deputy showed up in the neighborhood with graphic crime scene photos asking if anyone recognized the deceased victim that Talisa knew her brother was dead. Now, at first, she denied knowing the person in the photographs um, because she just couldn't accept that this was her brother. That's just a hell of a way to find out that a loved one's been killed. The 23-year-old was found with stab wounds and lacerations on his neck, back, and stomach, and he had received blunt force trauma. He had also been dragged through the woods while tied to a pickup truck. His body had been found in a grassy area near a power line along US-19, about 30 miles east of Atlanta, by a 10-year-old boy named Christopher Vaughn, who had been out squirrel hunting with his father and a group of men. Timothy Coggins was still wearing his underwear and jeans, but he was without a shirt, socks, or shoes. Police were called to the scene, and they located his beige sweater stained with blood. Police noted there were drag marks around a dirt trail in a pattern that ended with Timothy's body, which were consistent with a person having been dragged behind a truck. All because he dated a white woman. I mean, it's just, I just, it doesn't compute for me. I can't understand how someone could think like this. Well, we're going to get into it, Dylan. Now, that's what I would save this type of thing for a child molester. This is the, and a rapist. These are the people that deserve to be done like this, not some poor young black man who had a white girlfriend. It gets worse. Oh, my God. You're going to be super fucking mad here in a few minutes. He had abrasions on his body, which indicated a dragging had occurred. So, like, not only do they see the marks on his body, but it's there's a very obvious visible scene that this man had been dragged behind a truck. Franklin Gebhardt, known as Frank, and William Moore, known as Bill, and another man were waiting outside People's Choice. Ruth Guy was Frank Gebhardt's ex-girlfriend, and it angered him that Timothy Coggins was now seeing her. According to reports, Franklin Gebert had grown up kind of rough. He was a sixth grade dropout, had grown up drinking and fighting, and often used racial slurs. He had spent nearly his entire life living near Carrie's Mobile Home Park. Gebert had earned money logging timber. He was known to host wild parties with lots of beer, pills, and mushrooms. Yeah. There were reports of one party where a cow was butchered on the kitchen floor of the trailer. Oh, God. You imagine the smell? Ah, it's a lot. A whole cow in the kitchen? Gebert was inseparable from his brother-in-law, William Moore, and the pair were in and out of jail together. Tim knew the men and had even spoken to them outside the club before he had gone in on that particular evening, though no confrontation had occurred then. Tim had gone inside the club, and only later did Frank Gebert enter the club looking for Timothy. 
Tim left with Frank and even called his friend Samuel Freeman on the way to say he was with Frankie, who Freeman knew was Franklin Gebert. The four men, Gebert, Bill Moore, Timothy Coggins, and a fourth man that has been unidentified or hasn't been named in the press, they went to a trailer park in Sunnyside near where Frank lived at the time. Sometime in the early morning hours of October 8th, Frank and Timothy began arguing at the trailer park. I think earlier I said October 9th, but it's October 8th, sorry. Frank and Timothy began arguing at while they're at this trailer park. Bill Moore and Ruth Guy were present as well. Uh, Bill Moore and Ruth Guy got into the front seat of the car while Frank and Timothy got into the back seat. Now, at some point, Ruth Guy was let out of the car. I don't know if they dropped her off at home, but at some point, she's not in the car with them anymore. That's when the group drove in the direction of Mentor Road. That's when Gebert and Moore began stabbing Timothy Coggins in the back, wrist, torso, and neck. Then they chained Timothy Coggins to the back of their truck and dragged him behind it. Then they stabbed him some more. The men carved an X into his abdomen like a Confederate flag, like a battle flag. Coggins died from his stab wounds. The men then left his body in the grassy field, which was about a mile from that trailer park, under a massive oak tree, which was kind of known colloquially. Colloquially? Yeah, I have a dry mouth. Colloquially as the hanging tree. You you got a thick mouth right now, bitch. I need to take a sip of water, Dylan. (laughs) I have water. So thank you for making fun of me. Not only do I have a dry mouth, Dylan, but I also have some sort of sinusy thing happening. And here you are making fun of me, and I'm trying my hardest. Oh, my gosh. You are a cruel person. Hey, I just call it like I see it. Despite the preliminary evidence, about two weeks um, after police stopped investigating the murder. See, this is what really pisses me off about things like this, because you always have this reluctance up the line in... um, and, and the authorities and the police and the DA's office sometimes in these uh, small towns to not re- – because they kind of, what they're doing is they're being sympathetic with the perpetrators, I, I think, I suspect. Oh, you just wait. Uh, and that's, that's the worst part because the, these people deser- deserve to be, you know, um, the, the full weight of the court needs to bear down on these people's necks. Justice. Well, soon Timothy's family began receiving threats. Their stepfather had driven a school bus every morning, and someone left a bloody shirt in the bus for him to find. A brick was thrown through the family's window with a note attached that read, You're next. And then, a decapitated dog was left behind in the Coggins family driveway. Yet, despite these threats, nothing was done. The police never made any arrests, and the case went cold. And the threats were never investigated. Of course not. In 2016, Timothy's mother, Viola, had made a deathbed prediction to her daughter, Talisa, that Timothy's case was going to be solved. At the time, Talisa thought her mother, who was dying of kidney failure at Emory University Hospital, was just talking out of her head. Viola told her daughter, quote, I ain't going to be here for it, but they're going to get who killed Tim. Wow. Sounds like she's certain. A year after Viola had made claims she'd known the future to her daughter, the sheriff's department phoned to say they knew who'd killed Timothy. The investigation was going to be reopened, and after all this time, the investigators promised to deliver justice, though it had been three decades. Too late. Well, I mean, obviously better late than never, but still, that's infuriating that this family had to, this mother had to pass away without seeing justice done for her son. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation has about 350 investigators who handle major crimes for the rural regions of the state. Every six months, the agency recycles cold cases, even those that are decades old, to new investigators with hopes that fresh eyes can bring new light to them, which is pretty smart and kind of awesome. I must say, in the, all these years we've done these cases and we talk about the state investigators, be it, you know, Tennessee, North Carolina, whatever state we're in, the GBI has surprised me more than once in the cases with a very a good, um, just outside of the box thinking and uh, just some really good, they seem to have a really good program and really good investigators. They do. Yeah. Timothy's case had landed on the desk of a green investigator, brand new guy who only had two years as a special agent. His name was Jared Coleman. 
According to GQ magazine, Coleman was struck with the file, not because it contained overwhelming evidence, but because it had so little information. Well, yeah, and to anyone, that's going to let them know that it's not been investigated very hard. I, I think that's logical. Yeah, he was like in shock that this case had not been properly vetted. There were witness interviews that named two men, Franklin Gebert and William Moore. The two men, again, their brother-in-laws who lived in a trailer park very near where Timothy's body had been found. Police had interviewed Gebert, but had taken him at his word without further digging. The man's alibi had holes in it, but there was zero follow-up. William Moore, according to the file, had never even been interviewed. It was clear that Griffin police had dropped the ball on the case, and likely because it had been a white man killing a black man. To Lisa Coggins agreed. She felt law enforcement had known all along who killed her brother, but they just simply didn't care. Then Coleman learned that the 10-year-old Christopher Vaughn, who had found Coggins' body, was presently an inmate. I should also mention he's a convicted child molester. Oh, come on, kid. Yeah. He had written investigators before to say that Gebhardt had made numerous confessions over the years that he'd killed Timothy Coggins. According to Vaughn, Gebhardt had stated the murder weapon was thrown into a well behind his trailer. The first confession Vaughn had overheard was at a party not long after the murder had taken place. As Vaughn grew older, Gebhardt would bring up the murder and brag about how he had gotten away with it. Special Agent Coleman was stunned to see that police never followed up with Christopher Vaughn or Franklin Gebhardt. And so what do you think? So I think it's a good thing to have a mixture of, say you give a cold case to a veteran investigator. He's going to have, you know, be good, have techniques and have all this experience. So that's a plus. But I also think it's interesting to give cold cases to these new new investigators because they have that hunger they may look at things totally differently than, you know, people who've been doing it for years. So I think it's good to have a mixture of veteran and new investigators on these cold cases. Well, you know, and it's not to say that seasoned veteran detectives don't still have a passion for solving these crimes. Right, but they do make certain assumptions about things because they've been doing it so long. But I think you get a new person in there who's got, like, a fire in their belly to, like, do a good job and solve a case and, like... They, they're still, you know, starry-eyed and want to, like, make a difference in the world. Yeah. They're maybe not as burnt out as, you know, a more seasoned detective who's been doing it for 30 years and is on the verge of retirement. I agree. So, yeah. I mean, this guy, he's, like, but he to make it happen. He didn't have to dig very far to see problems with this case. No, That's the sad part. Not at all. Coleman tracked down William Moore for an interview. He felt the man was lying because Moore claimed he had never heard about the murder, a murder which had been the talk of the small town for decades. So that's a red flag. Someone who's never heard about this sensational story that everyone and their mama talked about for a 500 mile Yeah, I mean, radius. it had almost become like a bit of an urban legend. It was one of those horrific crimes in town that people knew about. You, you know, you talked about it. Your mama knew about it. Your grandmama knew about it. I mean, there's like generations of people living in this town who had heard of this horrific crime. Yeah, everybody's got their opinion about this type of a case. Yeah, and here's this guy saying he had no idea, had never heard of it. Interesting. Even though it had happened, you know, right in his down community. the road yeah. from where he lived. Yeah. Moore was evasive, and Coleman just had this gut instinct that the man was lying. The newly elected sheriff of Spalding County was a man named Daryl Dix, and he was eager to help Agent Coleman. Dix had learned after his election to office that many of the deputies who were employed at the time of Coggins' murder were active members of the KKK. Dix was concerned the lack of closure on the case wasn't just poor police work, but rather a vast conspiracy to cover up for a white man, Franklin Gebert, who was reportedly also involved with the clan. Dix assigned a new deputy to assist Coleman with the case. One thing was clear to the new investigators. Timothy Coggins' murder was personal and venomous. The man had been tortured. Coleman told GQ magazine that the murder was very, very clearly a lynching. 
thousands of black Americans were killed by lynching in the years following the Civil War up until World War II. Georgia was second to only Mississippi in numbers. A quarter of Southern lynchings, according to the Equal Justice Initiative, found were because of perceived sexual contact between white women and black men. White vigilante violence backed by the KKK never disappeared, and in most cases, the assailants were never punished. By April of 2017, when investigators tracked down Franklin Gebert, he was already in jail at the Spalding County Detention Center on an unrelated sexual assault charge. So he's just a piece of shit. Yeah. I mean, he has a lengthy criminal history. Right. He and his brother-in-law, it's like they play tag team who's going to jail this week. And, and that's all the more reason when you take have something like this, and you have someone who's capable of doing this to another human being. I think murder's horrible, but I think murder would be a, a, a prefaced by with torture before you murder the person should be like ten times more horrible. I mean, it's just it's just so bad. But this kind of person should pay for what they've done and be off the street because they're hurting, they're harming other people. Never fails. The 59-year-old denied any knowledge of Timothy Coggins' murder, claiming he hadn't heard about the murder and certainly never bragged about it. However, Gebert admitted he had been an alcoholic for the past 23 years, and there were a lot of things he didn't remember. Okay, yeah, I don't remember killing that guy and bragging about it later, but maybe I was just drunk. He invited the investigators to dig up the well on his property, and when shown the photo of... Timothy Coggins' body, he said he had never seen and then used a racial slur. Like, I've never seen that before. N-word. We can, yeah, we can gather what piece he said. Piece of shit. Yeah, he's a piece of shit. As the investigation pushed forward, more witnesses who admitted Franklin Gebert had frequently bragged about the crime um, started to talk. According to those who had overheard Gebert's statements, the motive had been because Timothy Coggins was sleeping with Ruth Guy, and that was his ex-girlfriend, and because he claimed the black man had ripped him off in a drug deal. See, who, who would use that word talking to cops and investigators? A fucking idiot. Someone who's still, he's trying to be slick. He's still trying to be slick. He thinks he's gotten away with this all this time, and he thinks he can say something like that to cops. <sighs> I just don't get it. He's just a piece of shit, Dylan. That's why he's in jail on a sexual assault charge, because he's a shitbird. And he just happens to be a racist shitbird. So I look at these pictures, and Timothy was a very handsome young man. He was. It, it's no wonder that the ladies noticed him. And, and very confident, you know, handsome young man. And then I look at these pieces of human trash who were being held responsible for his murder eventually, and they all look like fucking douche bags. They're they're unattractive, and this boils down to jealousy. They were jealous of this handsome young black man, and, and there you go. Yeah, they look like men who probably don't even know how to wipe their ass properly, let's be honest. Yes. They look grody. They're gross, and they look dumb, and they look stupid. <laughs> I got big, dumb, stupid, gross <laughs> Big, dumb, stupid, gross faces. Yes. And nasty jowls. <laughs> jowls. Nasty jowls. Oh, and jowls. Their jowls smell. Yeah. Ugh. Gross. Unfortunately, Ruth Elizabeth Guy, who was known as Mickey, um, had left the state immediately following Coggins' murder, and she had died in 2010. So there was no way of speaking to her about what had happened. Neighbors told Agent Coleman that, quote, Gebert killed that boy. An ex-girlfriend said that Gebert would abuse her and make threats that she would end up in a ditch like Coggins. Robert Smith, whose mother had dated Gebert, said the men, Gebert and Moore, would drunkenly laugh about the good old days when they could kill black people for fun. And this was in 2016 that they would make these jokes and be like, oh, it's too bad we can't go around killing black people like we used to. Pine them for the good old days. Well, I know what you would do if someone said this to you. You would cuss them out. I would headbutt their genitals. Yes. Probably, yeah. Damn, just headbutt them in the nuts. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. You just got to go low, Dylan. Just bashing. If I, if I headbutt somebody in their nuts, man, wow. 
I would I would like um this big Tanya noggin. Harding their knee with like a club or something. Okay. You know? You leave them laying there. Like I'm not going to let somebody talk talk crazy like that around me. There were tons of witnesses in the case, and it appears that the original investigators did very little to work this case. I mean, once Coleman starts talking to witnesses, there's a shit ton of people coming forward with information. These guys have bragged and mentioned this and threatened other people. Everyone around them has heard this before because they got off on the fact that they got away with it, and they were proud of it. They weren't ashamed of what they'd done. That's disgusting. And I'm sure they likely harmed other individuals. Let's be honest. When investigators searched Gebert's property, there were 60 knives seized, though Gebert would brag to current inmates that he had long since disposed of the murder weapon. He can't even keep his mouth shut in jail. Oh, yeah, I'm not worried about that because I got rid of the murder weapon. Okay. Yeah. A second warrant was executed, and police were able to excavate the well behind his trailer using Hydrovac technology. A white shoe was recovered, which was the correct size for Coggin's foot, two socks, and a logging chain, along with a white t-shirt and a broken piece of a knife and knife handle. Wow. Everything that Gebhardt said would be there. Sounds like they literally put a huge hose or something down in there and just sucked out sucked out all the contents of the well. Christopher Vaughn... Um, actually went into Franklin Gebert's cell wearing a recording device and asked about the murder because they're both in jail at the time. Since Gebert was not indicted yet, he initially denied knowing anything about it. But he said he didn't know um, what he might have said about the murder while he was drunk at a party. (laughs) Okay. Okay. And this party had been hosted by a man named Willard Sanders, who was another man whom on earlier occasions Gebert had named as being an accessory to the killing. So media reports wouldn't name the fourth person, but Gebert basically said it was this guy Sanders. And I don't know anything about it, but I can't remember what I said when I was drunk. I might have mentioned it. I don't know. I can't never remember nothing Mm. because I'm always drunk. What a moron. You know, I mean, if if I bragged about murdering somebody, I must have been drunk. What the fuck does that have to do with anything, whether you're drunk or not? We're talking about the truth here, sir. Oh, my God. Stupid, man. These dumb people got to live their lives out, and this poor young man was killed. I mean, that's just the, the, the saddest part of it. Yeah, exactly. Sandra Bunn, Franklin Gebert's sister, said that her brother didn't kill Coggins, But she was the most frequent um, person that he called from jail. So police started recording their phone calls. And Bunn advised her brother to keep his mouth shut, not to agree to any DNA testing, and not to accept any drinks from investigators because they could get his DNA. That sounds exactly the way an innocent man would act. Exactly. (laughs) However, a court order was obtained to get his DNA anyway. Sandra Bunn told the media that Daryl Dix, the sheriff, was trying to play to the black voters by reopening the case. By solving this. And it's just, it, you know, it's just all bullshit. People just don't know what really happened. Okay, he couldn't just be trying to find the, who murdered and tortured this poor young citizen. So not only is Gebert an idiot, but his sister is also just like a piece of shit. It's an American <laughs> citizen tortured and drugged behind a car or truck or whatever. And that's the bottom line. I just can't imagine... Knowing your brother did something this fucking terrible. And supporting them still. And still trying to help them cover their tracks. Yeah. Like, what What an enabling piece of shit she is. You hear that, Sandra? I, I, well, I fear that this points out that they came from a nest of shitbirds. Yeah, I think so. I mean, this, this type of ignorance is uh, so, a lot of times generational and passed from parents to uh, their little dumbass Dumb-faced kids. The ignorance is imprinted in their DNA. Yeah. Shirley Sisk, who had been manager of the trailer park, had told Agent Coleman that before the Coggins murder, Brenda Moore, who was Gebert's other sister and was married to Bill Moore. You remember they're like the inseparable brother-in-laws? Yeah. Yeah, I bet. So Brenda had been intoxicated one night when she told Shirley, this trailer park manager, that her husband and brother were planning to kill a man. 
Sisk had told Brenda to get her drunk ass to bed, not really believing her. So Shirley Sisk came forward and was like, yeah, she told me that her husband, her brother were going to kill a guy and she was drunk. And I just told her, like, get your drunk ass to bed. Yeah. Quit talking the the racial craziness. Yeah. Also, um, that same evening, Gebert was like, you know, railing about how he was going to go fight this guy. And Shirley Sisk was like, I just blew it off because he was always trying to fight someone. So it didn't. It didn't seem out of the ordinary when they're talking crazy about like, oh, we're going to go fight this guy. I'm going to kill this guy. She's like, he was always saying shit like that. So they don't mean nothing. It's just when they get real drunk, they get real racist. They don't mean nothing by it. They're just drunk. (laughs) I don't know what to say. This is. I don't know. This is this group of people's normal. Right. Right. Yes. Yes. And not to disparage people in trailer parks, no. but here in this trailer park, apparently this was just the norm. No, but I do appreciate, and I grew up you in got, trailer. You got Brenda drunk, right? You got Franklin wanting to fight everybody. I grew up in trailer parks, so I'm certainly not looking I down. Too. I had fun growing up in trailer parks. You know, plenty of kids to play with, with lots of interesting people. But yeah, every trailer park does have their two or three people that are just out of fucking control. And I can't appreciate... The fact that a trailer park comes up time and again in this story because it fits perfectly as a backdrop. Now, trailer parks are 99% full of just hardworking people, you know, trying to do their thing. There's exactly. the 1% that are something else. But I think it's like that in any neighborhood. Well, it's true. Right? Yes. In an apartment building, you might have the one or two knuckleheads. Yes. In any kind of suburban or you know, residential neighborhood. You're gonna have maybe that one house. We got the damn one house across the street now. Yes, it's a, it's a the drug house. The drug house. You There's never, always like people camping out in the front yard of this house. People living out, in the driveway. People tweaking. Yes. Out there like tearing their vehicle apart, looking for their lost drugs. <laughs> There's always some domestic happening. Never fails, right? Never fails. We're so lucky. So you always have. There's always going to be them fucking people. Right, and they just happen to be in this trailer park. They just happen to live in a trailer park. That's a good. That's a very good point because yeah. this is true. No matter where you move or what type of neighborhood, it, sometimes even you know it doesn't matter how expensive. Right, so I'm house. saying it's not just because they was in the trailer park, but I'm just saying this poor manager of this trailer park. She's just trying to do her job, and she's got to deal with like drunk Brenda. Yeah, Brenda's probably dumb husband Bill. Look, I just want to collect the rent. Her, I don't need her all this. stupid brother who's always trying to fight somebody. Yeah, <laughs> she's just like trying to make sure everybody's lawn is cut and their rent is on time. Right? Yeah, you paid uh, your lot rent. Now, I, I don't now need get to your hear, drunk ass home. I don't need to hear the rest of it. Right, exactly. Yes. In October of 2017, Franklin Gebert was arrested and charged with the murder of Timothy Coggins. William Moore was also charged. For years, the family didn't have a headstone on Timothy's grave for fear it would be vandalized. So after the arrests were made, the Coggins family held a 90-minute memorial service for Timothy. His brother Tyrone offered a um, a message during the service at Fuller's Chapel United Methodist Church, which also included a family gospel choir and a dance by some younger members of the family. They wore purple ribbons because purple was Timothy's favorite color. And they had t-shirts that read, at last, resting in peace. How sad. They can't even, they're afraid to put a tombstone on their, their poor, dead son, murdered, tortured son's grave. Because they're afraid some people will vandalize it. I just, it's stories like this that just makes me wonder... Um, some parts of the human race, just, uh, I don't know the depravity and just the, the ignorance is just, uh, I don't know. How can you go around with that kind of hate in your heart? Uh, it, I, I mean, and yeah. for no reason, for no reason, no reason at all. I feel like you have to be like a low functioning person. You're a very low frequency being. Yes. And you're not, you're, you're, you're not smart. You're not intelligent. You're not compassionate. You're not empathetic. You're all. You're not all these good things that make us decent people, and uh, you're just. Uh, we really should be. We don't need your type of person in our society. I'm. I'm sorry. I'm be honest. I mean, I wish there was someone to way to weed these types of people out of our society before they breed. I'm not even kidding. Prosecute. Oh, hot take. Well, I'm just saying, like a very positive. Um. Uh, 
good orientation, uh, some some eugenics, but for the best. Damn. No, I'm saying not eugenics based on race or religion or anything like that. Eugenics based on the fact that you're a fucking dumbass piece of shit monster. Okay? Those people. Damn, I think the ACLU going to come for us, Dylan. I, that is a hot take. I feel like shut we're... shut it down, bro. Well, it's just, you know, if I can set the program up and find out some way to identify these people beyond the re- uh, shadow of a doubt. Okay, so you get yourself like a Willy Wonka, one of those uh, weights, right, that, that the golden egg gets on and it tells you if it's a good egg or a bad egg and it sends the bad egg down the chute. Yeah. So we just, we have to invent a machine that's going to tell us good egg, bad egg. Okay, what if you just use decoys? Like, you know how when you, you know, like ant- like duck or deer decoys? So we just have the decoys of like some black teens. Is this too much? And then if someone runs out there and like tries to murder them or torture them, then we get we get those people. We just like suck them in with the decoys. I feel like I need to edit that out. You're a crazy person. Edit that out. Prosec- no, I'm leaving it in so people can hear what a dumbass you are. Prosecutor Marie Broder told ABC News that Coggins' murder was intended to send a message. He was known for dating white women and selling marijuana in white neighborhoods. He was ahead of his time and didn't subscribe to the rules laid out for a black man in rural Georgia in the early 1980s. Gebert was sentenced to life in prison plus 20 years. 59-year-old William Moore, who sat in a wheelchair during his sentencing, took a plea bargain which included voluntary manslaughter and concealing a body. And he was given 20 years in prison and 10 years of probation. But he died in 2018. Good. Daryl Dix, the sheriff, had uncovered a diary the former sheriff had kept in the 1980s, which included writings about infiltrating the KKK to gather information and how the KKK had infiltrated the police departments. It noted the sheriff didn't know who to trust, but was trying to uncover who in the department was in the Klan. Wow. That's amazing. Isn't that a wild discovery? Yeah, that's pretty, pretty, uh, from its historical relevance to, I mean, that's just very interesting in, in many ways. And it seems pretty obvious from the lack of work done originally with the Timothy Coggins case that he was on to something. Yeah, and there, it seems that it's not just one or two people. It's enough people to have a general sentiment about, because if it's just one or two people acting this way, the other investigators are be like, wait a minute, I'm going to do my job in this you know, it seems this is not really that hard of an investigation to figure out who did this. So we're going to go get them. So it was it was more than just one or two people, which is scary. That they that they've been infiltrated to that, uh, you know, that that bad. Yeah, I mean, it's this story, like I said, so infuriating. And it's and, just true for police departments all over the and south. It's horrible to think. I mean, this was not that long ago. This and, was only forty two years ago. So as much progress as we have made, I mean, we still have so much further to go as far as equality in this country. But this was just 42 years ago that this poor guy was lynched. Not far outside of a major city in the United States. I mean, 30 miles away from Atlanta. 42 years ago. So this happened when I was two years old. That is just, that's insane. And this is not um, just happening in the South. The Klan had a very strong presence in the Midwest, in the mid, uh, middle America. Is it the Midwest? And then all over this country, really, there's been, you can look in every, every even the most, what you think, Oregon. It strikes people as a very progressive state nowadays, right? Up until, I, I believe it was 93, they had to change a technical law on the book about black people opening a business in Oregon. Because it had been an actual law to stop them or slow them down from moving into the area. I mean, these types of things, when you, this is in a single lifetime, less than a lifetime, that we still, and we're still dealing with this stuff. Well, thank goodness this case fell into the right hands because yes. Agent Coleman, even though he was a, you know, a newbie, he'd only had two years on the force with the GBI, he was damned and determined he was going to close this case. So thank goodness he was there to facilitate, you know, getting this case reopened and and doing the legwork. 
connecting the dots that the original investigators just failed to do, and finally getting Timothy's family some justice. And I think it's really sad that his mother, Viola, passed away before she was able to see this case solved and her son's killer, you know, the killer's named. But I also think, like, how amazing that she, like, she knew in her heart and in her soul, like, they're going to find out who did this. And I may not live to see it, but it's going to happen. I mean, that, like, I don't know. That makes me want to cry. No, that's amazing. That, that and, a, it's a mother, the intuition, you know, she knew. And then eventually they held up, what, five people accountable. So that's a, that's amazing. All the way around on the cold case investigator's part. Yeah. <sighs> This is beyond the description of senseless, brutal violence. I mean, it truly is. It truly is. And honestly, I think they should be out, taken out, and drug across gravel until they die when you have done this to someone. Just old school eye for an eye, and I don't want to hear that shit and everybody's blind bullshit if we do that. That's just what they deserve because that's what this poor young man in the, you know... The world is his oyster. He's young. There's no telling what he could have went on to do when you have a vibrant, you know, confident young person like this. There's no telling what they're going to what they're going to contribute to society throughout their lives, and uh, yeah, it's such a cowardly. Act. It's very. And then there's four or five of you, and and you you know you just and if only he had not went outside that night. I mean, I, I hate to even have to say it like that, but I wish he hadn't, or you know maybe he thought he could didn't understand what it was about, or maybe, you know, th- uh, they may have tricked him if he was known to sell marijuana. Maybe they said, hey, there's somebody in the parking lot wants to buy some weed. Um, or maybe he thought he could talk his way out well, of this. Well, that's the thing. It almost seems like Timothy was such a happy-go-lucky kind of guy right. and was um, so friendly with everybody that maybe he had a hard time even, like, reconcil- reconciling that these men were this mad at him right when he hadn't done anything and he was like you know he knew he knew them and he thought well i can smooth this over like it's not anything that's like so serious it can't be fixed or right we can't work it out i mean i don't know it's really such a fucking sad story and i'm surprised that it hasn't had more um, recognition because it is such a terrible case and it has not been that long ago this that this happened. No. I mean, forty two years, nineteen eighty. That's not that far off. And you hear about these lynching cases, and you think thirties, forties. You don't think up to the you know nineteen eighty. And if you dug, you could probably find an instance of that past beyond nineteen eighty. There was an instance in Texas. Uh, someone was drugged behind a truck and, and then murdered uh, a black person. So and I believe that was might have been as as late as the early nineties because I remember when that happened. Yeah. So I just don't know when this is what's holding us back to a degree of uh, coming together and, and realizing that is we're all the same and we just want the same things out of life and it's okay if someone's different than you. We all and believe if you're, the same, right? We're I mean, just we're humans. All the same. We're just humans, and if we start would look out for each other, we would be so much stronger as a community. Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, like, regardless of your skin color, who you are, people just want, I mean, people want the same things, you yes. know? People want to be safe and happy and healthy and be able to take care of their families. Have a decent house. And pursue, you know, the American dream that we have here in this yeah. country. That's all I anyone wants. I mean, I think wants. that's what most people would agree on. I think everybody wants to have those same things. And in this day and age, I think we're, we're alike 95% alike and we're just 5% different, be it culturally, religious, even, you know, down to sexual orientation. We're mostly alike. And I think we should concentrate on the fact that we are pretty much alike and we have very small differences, but they want us to celebrate and concentrate on the difference differences between us and, and i think that's what in in some weird way they use that to keep us separated well, they do. to make us feel like we're in separate groups when we're and we're really not we're all american citizens we're all humans and we all want the same thing for the most part well maybe not all of our listeners are americans but well no yes we're just okay i'm sorry <laughs> yes we do we are listened to around well, the world no, but i think we're all uh, human beings but you know yeah here you know in the united states we have 
we have a lot of issues. Oh my, it's going to be the former United States. They keep on. Well, that's true. Hot take. All right. Okay, Heather. Thank you for that. Yeah. So that my resource a- today, there was a, a GQ article, which I mentioned, and a lot of newspaper articles um, over the years. Newspapers.com. One of my favorite resources when researching older cases. I, I must say, uh, you can get so much good if the newspaper articles that happen right when the, you know these cases, older cases happened. You just get a treasure trove of information, and uh, that's a really great resource. And I know that this case made you sad while you were putting it together because it just reminded once again how you know you never know who the monsters are, it's right? True. All right, thank you, and uh, thank, I'm glad you survived your day uh, around the American youth, and I wish you the best of luck the next time you have to try that out, right? Oh, it'll be 7.30 tomorrow morning. <laughs> and thanks once again to Tish, this week's sponsor. I appreciate your support, and we hope you enjoy the ad-free and commercial-free content, the ad-free and extra content on Patreon. Patreon, yeah. Yes, go check it out. If you have a listener tale, we are getting ready to put together some listener episodes, listener tale episodes for the month of October, heading into spooky season. And if you have a creepy story, ghost story, something weird, unexplainable, something kind of bizarre, send us an email, mountainmurderspodcast at gmail.com. Do it. Love to hear from you. Do it. Bye.